Greetings, I'm Lisa Stone and I welcome you to a guided tour of Roger Brown's bedroom. An arc of cultural, artistic, and personal histories can be gleaned in the carefully arranged artworks and objects in this room. Things he surrounded himself with in the most intimate setting of his bedroom reveal Brown's Alabama and gene genealogical roots, histories of slavery in the South, histories of descendants of enslaved people through works by African-American craftspeople and self-taught artists, and associations with the slave trade through objects from West Africa, with Brown's artworks and those of his brother and his friends woven into the broader historical narratives in this dense arrangement. By way of introduction, for those of you unfamiliar with the Roger Brown Study Collection, it's a house museum, archive, and special collection of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago at 1926 North Halstead Street. The second floor and two stairways of this two-story 1888 brick storefront are preserved as Brown arranged the spaces as his Artists Museum of Chicago. With a melange of art and objects, from many cultures and genres, installed in visual and associative conversations, from room to room. Brown distilled a remarkable range of histories through objects that carry them into a kind of microcosmic constellation of relationships from the collective cultural to the deeply personal in his bedroom. Through Brown's selection and arrangement of objects, he created an emotionally charged place that reminded him through every angle and view of his own place in historical and perhaps also psychic space and time. Occupying the center of the room, the bed is layered with fabrics, noticeably the quilt with one of the variations of the classic log cabin pattern a pattern that became popular in 1863 when the Union Army was raising money for Civil War efforts by raffling quilts. There was a strong symbolic association of Abraham Lincoln and, and the log cabin. Brown's ancestors on his mother's side sided with the Union Army. I've long considered the bedroom, and particularly this quilt, the beating heart of the Roger Brown study collection. Quilt historian Barbara Brackman wrote, quote, log cabin quilts first popped into print during the Civil War. The design of a square framed by rectangular, quote, unquote, logs became a late 19th century fad so popular that county fairs created categories just for log cabins. The name may also be political, likely related to Abraham Lincoln's 1860 presidential campaign linking him to Kentucky and his rural roots. We can trace Roger Brown's depictions from childhood to mature works at the height of his career through his um, depictions of Abraham Lincoln. This early portrait, possibly done in grade school after Brown learned that Lincoln had been assassinated, shows Lincoln's thought balloon with what appears to me to be a coffin shape. Maybe Brown depic depicting Lincoln thinking of his own death. Brown developed his skill in a later portrait of Lincoln, emphasizing the president's height by his downward gaze. And in 1889, Brown made this iconic portrait of Lincoln with the enigmatic title, Lost America. What was he thinking? What was Lincoln thinking? For years, this painting was hung in the east end of the Chicago History Museum, creating an interesting spatial relationship to Augustus St. Gaudens' Lincoln the Man in the park outside. Dennis Adrian described the bed and by extension quilts, which are made as bed coverings, as the place of birth and death and sleep and dreams. With artworks hanging on the wall above the pillows, I realized that Brown couldn't even sit up in bed and read. It was a place for sleep and dreams. 
it was here that Brown's love and life partner of 12 years, architect George Veranda, died of lung cancer in 1984. To the right of the bed, or left if lying in it, stands the pie safe from Roger's grandmother at Brown's weathered clabbered cottage in Providence Community, Alabama, where Roger and his parents lived briefly when he was quite young, before the family moved to Opelika, Alabama. Brown called this his genealogy cabinet. He wrote, quote, in 1969, before Roots by Alex Haley made genealogy a national hobby, I began a quest to trace my family history, end quote. Tracking his ancestors through space and time was to occupy Brown for nearly 30 years. Roger hand tinted the background of the photo of William Jackson Owsley, shown on the right, to make the portrait more distinct. Owsley was an ancestor through the Brown side of the family, and it was given to Roger by his grandmother Brown as it was yellowed and she knew he would take care of it. The Pie Safe preserves photographs and objects such as a cloth-bound family Bible, a naval band and possibly umbilical cord from his great-grandfather's birth, his baby shoes with his Aunt Iva's notes tucked within, among other family photographs and keepsakes. On the floor next to the Pie Safe is a beam that Brown rescued from the old John Palmer cabin built in 1784 for ancestors on his mother's side of the family when the house was in derelict condition and apparently couldn't be saved. When relative humidity rises, this beam infuses the room with a rich woody aroma. In 1990, Brown was well into his career. He looked back to his ancestral history in several paintings, including Old John Palmer Homestead on Buffalo Creek, near the confluence of the Broad and Pacolet Rivers, north of Union, South Carolina. Slave Boy Rides a Deer and Indian Steals the Livestock. Brown often gave works titles as long as it took to describe a painting's nuances. We found this image among Brown's slides and believe it is the Old John Palmer Homestead. By 1990, when Brown was known for narrative works addressing a range of subjects, from searing social and political works, paintings addressing religion and sexuality in many guises, popular culture, the art world, landscapes and nature, the nexus of nature and culture, the weather, and particularly the clouds as the larger backdrop for the human endeavor below, among many others, at this moment, he looks back to the vernacular architecture of Alabama and the South in ancestral homes of the type utilized by my forefathers, shotgun, dog trot, slab end, log houses. A baseline for considering Roger Brown's life in art, his collecting and placemaking, which were inextricably commingled, was his ardent determination to ignore, or if possible, eradicate, what he considered irrelevant boundaries between the vernacular and the academically informed. Given the chance, he would celebrate or champion the vernacular. He wanted people to know about these modest and practical dwellings before they all disappeared. Back to the bedroom. A centrifugal moment in the room is the striking painting of a horse and a mule by Bill Trailer. Born into a family of enslaved people in 1853, Bill Trailer survived 12 years as an enslaved person, then years of reconstruction, the terrors of the Jim Crow South, and about the worst his country served up and later in life, as a homeless man in Montgomery, Alabama, he began to draw and paint. His spectacular, if improbable, body of work, including this drawing, was celebrated in the exhibition Between Worlds, The Art of Bill Trailer at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, 
curated by Leslie Umberger. Moving to the east side of the room, to the right of the genealogy cabinet, a shelf holds 19 ceramic vessels and objects made by the Jerry Brown pottery in Hamilton in northern Alabama. Jerry Brown was no relation to Roger Brown, but Roger Brown was born in Hamilton and he loved pottery. He may have wanted works made from the earth where he began life, close at hand in his bedroom. To the right of the shelf with ceramics, a cotton basket redolent of slave labor hangs next to a shelf with large ceramic vessels, the two on the right which date to pre-Civil War from the Edgefield District of South Carolina. The Edgefield District is known as the region where enslaved people who were highly skilled potters lived and worked. On the shelves behind are sweetgrass, sweetgrass baskets from coastal Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, made by descendants of enslaved peoples and one of the oldest crafts of African origin in the United States. The closet below contains Brown's shirts, slacks, and jackets alongside his partner, George Veranda's military uniforms from when he was a lieutenant in the Navy for five years in the Vietnam War. While these garments never shared closet space, we brought them together posthumously. In 1989, on a trip to West Africa, Brown was able to experience a point of embarkation for enslaved African people. He wrote, quote, we took the ferry to the island of Goree where the slaves were shipped out. The island is just as it was then with colonial stucco buildings in muted pinks and ochres. The original building stands at the edge of the water where the victims of the slave trade were kept, end quote. In this historically charged area of the room, under the cotton basket, is a painting by Roger Brown's younger brother, Greg, and under that, a carving by the African-American self-taught artist, Elijah Pierce, a barber from Columbus, Ohio. The study collection contains 56 works by African-American self-taught artists, including several works by Alabama-born artist, William Dawson, who later worked in Chicago and whom Brown championed. Several figural sculptures by William Dawson are pictured on the right on the shelf next to the bed. On the west side of the room are several objects acquired from Brown's trip to West Africa in 1989, including the sculpture on the upper left. Brown recounted that the group he traveled with was mostly uh, filled with competitive collectors who brought, bought objects throughout the trip, including a particular scrum for masks that were sold in their hotel lobby. He parodied this in his painting, African Hotel, which shows a contemporary tourist hotel in the shimmering Senegalese heat with tourists in the windows doing touristy things. The window on the upper right features a figure perhaps a self-portrait holding this particular sculpture. The narrative comes full circle in eight paintings by Roger Brown from 1967 to 1969, six of them near the ceiling and two in the niches near the floor below, made in the years when Roger Brown hit his stride and began his career as a serious studio artist. Above his bed, on the right, he hung, perhaps as a muse, a beguiling drawing by his dear friend Barbara Rossi and a Benin Fon applique above that. The two imposing monoprints of exaggerated facial expressions were made by Brown's friend, the artist Robert Gordy, who died in 1986 at age 52 of HIV AIDS, a fate Brown and Gordy shared, although Brown lived longer and died of AIDS a week a few weeks before his 57th birthday in 1997. Many people appoint their bedrooms with pleasantries and choose to rest among objects that calm and soothe. Brown chose to rest among memories of his immediate family and more distant ancestors, to be surrounded by difficult histories, by works of art that inspired 
and the complexities inherent in a life lived. At the end of the day, he emptied his pockets of change and took his place in bed in this densely charged space. We do our best to interpret this tapestry of artistic and cultural connections in tours and conversations with artists, students, scholars, and other guests. We welcome you to visit in person when we're all back at work. For now, please visit our website to find a range of online resources. And take good care. And I thank you. <laughs>